All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Can you guys hear me okay back there? Excellent, thank you. Uh, so welcome everybody, my name is Justin Grody. I am here to present to you about optimizing Visual Studio Code for PowerShell. Um, I'm not gonna do the usual poll of how many people have used PowerShell or how many people use Visual Studio Code, how many are still using ISE, et cetera, because honestly at this point, like, it doesn't really matter. Like, if you still prefer to use ISE, um, I totally understand that. I've been using VS Code for about, now about five to six years, and I've found ways that it just really helps with my productivity flow. So I'm hoping that, you know, if you do, you might see some things that might be helpful, but this is not a, this is not a use VS Code or you're a terrible person. You're like, you know, it, but this might just give you some ideas. Like, if you're still kind of thinking about it, you're on the fence, you maybe, you know, because it is a big shift. I mean, I did it like five, six years ago, and it was, it was painful. I mean, like, I had to relearn how to do a bunch of different things, but I mean, I can unequivocally say that just like how PowerShell you know, the sacred vow of PowerShell is, you know, you take the time to learn PowerShell, it's one of the best things you'll do for your career because you can use it everywhere. I did that 15 years ago and it's, you know, I'm still here just very much driving a powerful career with PowerShell. Learning Visual Studio Code was the second biggest thing that I ever did because not only do I have this great tool for PowerShell, but now I also have this tool that when I need to do TypeScript, when I need to do C Sharp, when I just want to dabble with them, I don't have to learn a whole new JetBrains or any of that kind of stuff. Like I can just use the tooling that I know and the time, the time that I've invested in that helps carry over to all these other things. So, um, so most of this presentation is mostly just going to be a lot about going over some neat little tips and tricks on how to optimize the environment. One thing I want to emphasize, this is not a getting started with VS Code presentation. Um, this, is, this is, we're going to go into the weeds on a bunch of stuff. We're going to go into a lot of what's happened in the last year, which has been a ton, and just show off a lot of really neat, cool stuff, stuff that I was just Stuff that I've learned from my experience spending a bunch of time in it over the year, little tricks that I've found here and there, and hopefully help you like, get some thoughts and thinking about ways you can use Visual Studio Code to you know, make your PowerShell experience even better. But that being said, like, if you've never seen Visual Studio Code before in your life, don't panic. Like, even if you don't understand a word of what I'm doing up here, you're just going to see little things here and there. You're like, oh, that's kind of neat. Like, I can see like, how that could help me. But like, you, know, you don't have to feel intimidated like you're going to be totally lost with the stuff that we're doing here. We're just mostly just going to go through just a bunch of fun little neat things. It's going to be very demo heavy, um, and we're just going to just go through all those kind of items. Come on, what's your... Uh, no. <laughs> well, that was my presentation. <laughs> Who cares about slides? Uh, so my, my name is Justin Grody. I'm a Data Center Solutions Architect and Microsoft MVP. Um, these are sort of just my links. So basically, pretty much, I put a lot, all kinds of stuff that I fiddle with and make up out there on GitHub. And so that's my GitHub. Um, GitHub has this feature called GISTs, if you're not familiar with them, which are just sort of like easy little like one-off scripts. They, they are actually full repositories, too. But I put a lot of stuff out there, lots of little handy little scripts and bootstrap scripts and little ideas that I have. Um, and then, of course, there's my Twitter. I post all the time about stuff that I'm doing, um, you know, trash on opinions. I've, the nice thing about being an MVP is I don't have to toe the Microsoft line if I don't want to. So like, if there's stuff I don't like, I, I talk about it. So um, yeah, so those are, those are my main links. And so yeah, so if you want to follow me, you want to see my stuff there, feel free. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to Ally Digital, my employer, which sponsored my travel to be here. And they've always been a great support of me. Um, big multinational MSP, I've been with them for 15 years. You know, our main thing is, you know, there's a big talk that we always talk about is, you know, the whole thing about build versus buy. If you, know, if you run a business, your core competencies, like, that's where you make money. Like, you don't, you don't have a electrical department. You don't have a sewer department. You, you contract those out to utilities. So these days, even more and more, you can do that with IT. And we're the, we're the people who are there for that. You have your core competencies. You have your main things, your core line of business applications. But you don't want to, you know, your focus is on your applications and not your infrastructure. Basically, what we do is we take over that portion of it. And so we do that. We, Big, you know, big global company, all kinds of that kind of stuff. Great company to work for. I've had a great time with them. So if you have an interest in that kind of stuff, check them out. And again, thank, thanking them for helping me to be here today. Um, so this is kind of becoming sort of like a pseudo series. I've done, did this last year, and I also did it at PSConf EU. Um, and I think I have a third one that I didn't have up here that I did for PWSH24. Um, actually, I think that might be the one on the right. 
But um, if you just Google like optimizing Visual Studio Code for PowerShell, my name, it'll probably come up. Loads of extra tips. Um, I'm going to try not to, most of the stuff that's in those I'm not going to cover here. But if you want to learn some stuff about neat little settings tweaks, settings files, all kinds of cool little extensions, um, great presentations to go back and check out. Um, for this presentation, I'm going to do a bunch of different little samples. Uh, I have a repo out there, uh, which is the, just on my GitHub, just PS Summit 2023 demo. Um, I'll get the slide in there, too, so you'll have all the links and everything. Um, it's, it's not a very complicated. There's just like a couple scripts that are just sort of sample scripts. But they're nice things that you can maybe just take and then run in your own little VS Code and kind of see the same demos like I did. And then the um, link at the top, I honestly completely forgot what that is. Um, oh, I know. That, that is my settings file. So um, if you go to that link, it will take you to a GIST that is my VS Code settings file. And it's like five, it's like a thousand lines long at this point because I love to tune and tweak every little thing I can and not just in PowerShell. So if you want to look like, you know, because if you ever go into VS Code, there's a massive ton of settings. It can be super overwhelming. You don't know what's good, what's not. Well, I've invested a whole bunch of time in playing with the stuff that I like. So for my personal preferences, you can go in there and see things. You just might see something like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know you could undock the debug thing and have it just float around so that you don't have to have it stuck over there. There's a little stuff like that. So that's a good thing to go through. And if you go through some of the past presentations, one of my past presentations was basically, even though it was a couple of years ago and there's a lot of new settings, one of my past presentations was just kind of going through each one of those, and it was all commented with like why I chose this. It's like why I like this, why I don't, what's there, what's not, that kind of a thing. All right, so here's VS Code. This is my VS Code. So it's got a few things that are a little different than out of the box. I'm one of those weirdos that likes the activity bar on the right, and the reason why I like that is when I do this kind of stuff, my code doesn't move back and forth. I hate that. Like whenever I like open something, my code jumps, it goes back, it goes here, it goes back. I want all that stuff over here. Now, that being said, one of the really nice things that's been added to VS Code is if you do Control-Shift-P, by the way, if you don't know Control-Shift-P, also, like, I think F1 they now make, so that's, like, much easier. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm my old cranky, you know, I, I'm very bad at learning new tricks. But uh, this is what's called the command palette in VS Code. And so if you've never seen this, this is basically just Google for VS Code. Like, everything, pretty much everything you can do in VS Code is in here. Like, if you scroll this thing, this is going to take me, watch that scroll bar over there. You know, we, we could sit here for probably half the presentation for everything you can do, because pretty much everything you can do in VS Code is in this menu. But it all auto-completes. So if you want to do debug, if you want to do that kind of stuff, what the heck was that? But, um, so the kind of thing I want to show is, um, first thing I want to do is turn on screencast mode, because I have a big thing circled over here to remind myself to do that. So again, as you type things, like it'll figure just, it's, it does kind of fuzzy matching and fi finds everything that kind of matched what you typed. So one of the things I'm going to turn on here is screencast mode so you can see it when I do little keystrokes and that kind of stuff. Um, one of the other things I'm going to do here is I'm going to show this thing. There's this new thing called a secondary sidebar. So you have sort of your main bar. You're pretty used to that. Um, but what they've added is they've made a new additional sidebar that you can put anything in there. Now, I have a couple things in here. I, I like my little test extensions that go in there. I like there's this thing called Thunder Client, which is a really cool REST API tester. Um, it's really handy for like when you just want to like test the thing and see like what result you get back and it's got all kinds of funky cool things Definitely something worth checking out um, That's another talk though But what's neat about this is you can just drag and drop the stuff wherever you want So if you particular like to have your source control you can just grab that guy and take your um, or take your not that there take the take your source control and Take one of these guys and bring them over. Why is this not being happy with me? There we go so you can have your source on one side while you have that over there. And so it's all really nice to just kind of drag around and picture however you want to organize your stuff. Sometimes one thing I know that's pretty popular, once I get this guy back where he belongs, um, one thing I know is pretty popular is to take this thing called your outline view and bring it over here so that you have your files on this side, but you have like the outline of the file that you're working on over here. And you have this really nice way of like looking at your code, especially if you like, have like a really long PowerShell script. This is just sort of like a nice sort of like summary of where things are and you can kind of click through them. So just something to keep in mind. Like this little sidebar is just another place to put things and it's really easy to bring in and bring out. It doesn't have a default key bound to it, but like I, the great thing about VS Code, again, Control Shift P for everything, they type keyboard, you have this preference for open keyboard shortcuts and you can go in and define a shortcut for every single one, again, this list is just as long as the list that you saw earlier when you do Control Shift P and then some. And in here, you can make a shortcut to anything you want. Um, so 
I, I like I have a shortcut that just very quickly like expands and contracts that sidebar as a thing. So it's a very handy little thing to have, and just keep it in mind so you can have this kind of nice little view. Um, one thing I'll go over again is that VS Code, one of the greatest things about VS Code is that it's built for extensions, and the way that the extensions tie into VS Code allows them to do pretty much anything. And so there's a massive ecosystem of, of extensions to do pretty much anything you could possibly want. Uh, you know, basically, if somebody's built it, you know, it it's going to be available. And so one thing I've made is this thing called the PowerShell Extension Pack. Um, how many of you guys have installed the PowerShell Extension Pack or saw it? Okay, awesome. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, this is starting to tick up there, like 20,000 downloads, not too shabby. I'm pretty happy with that. All this is, it's literally just, and you can make these, it's just basically a glorified JSON file. But this is just my opinionated thing of like, hey, if you work in PowerShell and you do development probably in a source control like GitHub, these extensions are going to be useful to you. And so when you install this pack, it goes ahead and just automatically installs all these extra extensions that I think will be helpful for you. And in addition, but you don't have to install them all. Like you can go in here and selectively, you can just look at my list and then selectively choose them out of there. And so that's a really handy way that like if you're just getting started with PowerShell and you just don't know what's out there and you just kind of want to get a sense, you can just install that PowerShell extension pack and it'll bring in all kinds of stuff from Markdown and all kinds of fun coloring and all kinds of other stuff to give you an idea of like sort of more what's possible when you really want to get beyond just like the initial starter of VS Code. So um, one thing I want to cover that is a new feature that is helpful to pretty much anybody, even if you don't even use Git. Like if you don't even use Git at all, if you if you just still write your scripts on file, then like that's totally fine. One thing that um, has been added to VS Code, which is super helpful, is this thing called the timeline view. So in your t in your timeline, as you go, any file that you have on your file system that you're editing in VS Code, every time you save it, it's going to make a backup for you, and you can see it right here in the timeline. So for instance, this, this completers demo I was working on, so we go back to the beginning, you know, not a lot in here. But you can go back as long as it keeps history, and you can see each step of the way and what was, um, what was being, oh, my mouse finally died? I knew it was going to die on me. It was like on its last leg, so we're switching to the touchpad here. Um, yeah, so yeah. The funny thing is, yeah, does anybody have a micro USB cable, that relic of, of two, 2021, like God forbid? I, fl I flew up here, or I drove up here, and like of all the cables I packed, it's like the first time I packed like all USB-C cables and totally forgot that my mouse doesn't use it at all. Uh, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Get that man a t-shirt. Yeah. All right, and we're back probably here in a minute. We'll see. All right, anyhow. So the really nice thing about this is that, as you can see, not only do you see um, you know, the previous versions, but you get this nice diff view that'll show you what you changed at that time that you saved. So if you're ever working on a script, and then you, you, know, you get a, your script, you know, I've done this a million times. It's like you get to work on a script, you get it like good enough, like it's working, but it's like slow, or like you don't like how it's laid out. So you're like, oh, let me try something else. And like, like that, that's good, that works, I'm ready to ship that, but let me try something else. And I go in, I go through, and I edit, and I save, and I'm, I'm not paying attention, I'm not like committing as I go. And then suddenly like I do my new thing, it doesn't work, but then like, okay, now I need to get it back to the where it was working, but oh crap, now I can't get it back to how it worked because I forgot like what I was doing, or I'm missing some character somewhere. So what this is really nice for is like you don't even have to think about it. It's there for you, and if um, if you know if you end up in that situation, you can just simply go back and see. Oh, okay, I can go back at a certain time and just say uh, like, oh, okay, there, there's the version. There's the version like before I was doing any of that kind of work. Yeah, you had a question. Does the, does the timeline follow along if you're also doing stuff in remoting? Or yes, it does. And there's actually a really nice new feature. This is very new that I was going to get to. Good segue called cloud changes. If you turn this on, it will synchronize it across all your VS Code instances wherever they are. So like if you're doing a VS Code on a work computer, and assuming they let you all sign into the same Microsoft account, you can turn on cloud changes. And even if like, this will even include like if you have an unsaved file in your editor, like you haven't gone through and saved it yet, it'll keep that in sync for you if you, if you enable the certain settings for it so that you can close your laptop at work, you know, and then open your laptop in a completely, a completely different laptop that you know, as long as you're signed into the same VS Code profile, and those unsaved changes will show right up. So, yeah, really cool stuff. It's, it's, it's sort of built on the sync engine that they use. It uses all the same sort of sync backend, 
Um, but yeah, really cool feature, brand new, fairly brand new, check it out. And it's really simple, it's literally just turn it on, you select the account that you want to use it with, and then it just starts running. Uh, um, another really nice new feature that has been added is the concept of profiles. So in the past, like if you have a VS Code thing and you have like a project, you have like your personal settings and you have like workspace settings, and you also have like, if you do like a workspace file, you can like do different settings of the different projects. So there's already like a pretty robust like hierarchy of how you can have settings and things. But one thing that comes up sometimes is like, especially if you're like, you know, if you work across a lot of different languages, um, a lot of times you'll have a big bloat of extensions or you might have certain settings for certain profiles. Like you have some customers that they want you to write all your, you know, they want, they want your uh, PowerShell formatting to have the, the bracket, the brace right next to, um, right next to the function or whatever. Whereas you may have another client where they want the brace where it's like indented. And then you tell them, okay, well just set me up a PS script analyzer uh, settings file in your repo. And they're like, what's that? So you go, okay. But you don't want to go back and forth each, you don't want to toggle that setting back and forth between the two customers. So that's basically what this new profiles feature is. So if you just go down to your um, information, your little settings gear here, and I know that's kind of small. I, I, I bumped up the DPI. Let me, let me see if I can redo the DPI again. I thought I had this bigger than that. Uh, I thought I bumped it to 150. That's ah, a 150. Okay, VS Code is just being small, so let's try this. There we go, that's better. Okay, so um, over here you now have this little thing for profiles. And so you can create these new profiles. So what VS Code has done is they've worked hard for both not just your um, settings, but also like your view, like how you position things on the screen. Basically all the stuff that goes into setting sync, what extensions you want to have installed. And so when you switch to a different profile or you create a new profile, it switches to that. If it's a different, you can have a different theme so you can tell the difference between customers. It's a completely like, it's almost like a container for your settings and your extensions and everything. So now that I go into this one, You'll notice like now my toolbar's over on the left, a lot of the icons that were there are gone, so I don't have anywhere near as many extensions installed as I used to because I'm working in this particular environment, I don't want certain extensions to be there because maybe they conflict or maybe they cause my VS Code to slow down because they weren't written properly to activate. So um, in this, like I just want the PowerShell stuff so it starts up fast and it does that kind of stuff. And I have my own custom settings for this. And you see down on the icon there, there's that little DE for demo. So these all also work with setting sync. So if you make a profile, it'll go into setting sync. And so you can go to another computer and still have that profile. And what's really neat is these are exportable. So you can set up an environment just how you like it. Like you could set up a reference environment for somebody coming into your um, environment and you can just click this export profile and you can choose the individual items you want to export and it'll dump it out to a JSON file. So it's a little bit more than just the settings JSON file, but you'll see, it even includes your UI state. So you can set something up where, remember how I said like the side panel, like you wanna have certain things in this side panel and over there? You can save that state as a profile and then give that to somebody and give them like that view. And so that's a really helpful thing, really powerful for like getting teams to be on a consistent thing, easy way to like get them restored. And this works with um, code spaces. I'm not gonna, I'll talk about code spaces a bit, but basically it's just a way to um, run VS Code in a container and there's lots of ways to do it, code spaces and dev containers. But you can add this so that when somebody first comes into your environment, they can get like the view that you want them to have of your repository in terms of where the tools should be and such like that. You know, that gets really opinionated. We all as developers have our own ways of like how we like to do things. But it's just sometimes it's nice to know that it's there as an option. If not so much for like, oh, I want you to work the way I do, but more in terms of, hey, let me give you like a preset of VS Code so you don't have to figure this stuff out, but check this out. Like you've already got the test extension and it's there in the corner and it's, I've already added the settings for you to, you know, bring in the special version of .NET that I need to write the certain thing I have. Or, or you know, I have it set up so that it defaults to PowerShell 7 instead of PowerShell 5.1, so you don't have to learn how to toggle that kind of a thing. So really neat new thing. Um, the settings profiles are there. And this also enables, you know, not as, not as like direct to you guys, but one thing that's really neat is on the command line, there's now things where you can do like dash dash profile and select your profile that way. And where this comes in really handy is like, so I do some contributions to the VS Code PowerShell extension. And like, I'm not a member of the Microsoft team. I'm not, I just, I have some frustrations and my code is very much like my house. Like it just, like I have frustrations just like my house. It'll just get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And then there's gonna be a point where I just snap and I'm just gonna clean the whole damn place up. And that's how I am with like features. Like 
with, with, the, with the, debugger, uh, the debugger feature, which I don't know, how many of you guys were in the VS Code presentation yesterday with the team? Okay, that's pretty good. So you know how they were talking about the debug, and they kept pointing to me, they kept being like, Justin added this feature. Well, that, that's, me, that's me in my house after probably about two or three months of being super frustrated that it wouldn't do this thing to the point that like, you know what, I can't take this anymore. I don't care if I have to learn, if I have to spend two months learning TypeScript to figure out how to write this stupid thing, I'm gonna fix it, because it's driving me crazy. That's how half that stuff comes in there. Anyhow, um, th that's a long way of talking about, so with profiles, um, what you can do is that in the testing, you can make it so when you test an extension, you can use a profile sort of like a temporary location. You didn't used to be able to do this before. You basically, like, it had to share your settings. So like when we would run tests, it would screw up all our settings. So you can make these little isolated environments for actually testing the UI of VS Code. So we added in a bunch of that test scaffolding to the VS Code extension, and it, it makes it a lot easier for us now to like test, test features that actually like can you know, be verified that they work right in the extension without the test being really difficult. If you were in that presentation, they talked about spending like months and months and months of rewriting the tests. Most of that was actually in like the C-sharp part of the extension, which is called PowerShell Editor Services. But the actual editor part of the extension, like the client part, still like the tests are still, still kind of loose because of this limitation. But now that we were able to take care of that, um, we were able to kind of get a lot of that stuff sorted out. So that stuff should move forward a lot faster. Not something that's like super relevant to you, I know, but it is good to know that like profiles now ha is this really nice feature that took a lot of work, but is now has this ability to really isolate your settings, be able to let you distribute them, distribute a profile, and allow you to have those different environments without having to do the sort of hacky stuff we used to have to do, like use Peacock to like say, oh, in this folder, you know, just dynamically change my theme so that I know this window's this one and such. Now all that stuff works great and it's built in. Um, so we'll move on to um, another item that was added that is super helpful for PowerShell. Um, so one, one common thing that comes up is like when you're going to start a new PowerShell project in VS Code, um, how many people like have, have, oh, did you have a question? I'm sorry, thank, thank you. Yeah. My profile, so I have my settings JSON out there. I don't really have, I haven't really exported my profile because it's, um, it, the JSON is really hard to edit, and there's some private stuff in there that like, I would have to go through and change. I'll, I'll, if, like, you know, I'll tell you what, like, I will go through there, and I'll sanitize, and I'll put it out as it is. Like, it's always changed. I'm not gonna keep it up to date, because it's just a pain. Like, I would have to write a PowerShell script just to sanitize the thing, but um, um, I can put a version of mine out there that's like, yeah, and so like, if you import my profile, you'll get like, where I put my test thing and where I arrange stuff. So you'll open it and be instantly lost. So if that's what you want, feel free, but. <laughs> Yeah, I can do that, so. But yeah, but if you want to share them, like again, you can export that JSON, and like I said, you just throw it up on a GIST, you know, you add a bit.ly link to it, and it's like, hey, do you want your VS Code to look like mine does when you do a presentation? Just go to this link, download the JSON, and import it, and now all of a sudden it'll automatically, re-magically do your VS Code to look like they did. And you don't have to do a lot of like, pro you literally just, you set up the VS Code how you want, and then click export. You don't have to like learn how to like edit a JSON to do it, so. Um, yeah, real, really nice feature, um, and it was, it was a, a it was an item that was there for like a long, long, long time on the lists, so. All right, um, one other, not one other, we're gonna do a lot more than one other, but uh, next item is on these things called, so the question that I had for you guys was, who here has ever actually like done debugging in, in the VS Code PowerShell? Like have you ever run a script, gone to a breakpoint? Great, so when you first open VS Code, most of the time like the first thing you have to do when you start a new repo is you gotta build that launch JSON so that that stuff actually works, right? Like you gotta go in, you gotta click like add configuration, all that kind of stuff. So what you can do now, I'm gonna do control comma, which is the fast way to get into settings. And I'm gonna flip over to the JSON view because that's how I roll. Oh, and again, and then again, here's kind of a neat thing is like, you can both see your personal settings and then you can go to like whatever your current profile is setting. So actually I probably just need to go back to my other profile. But you know, you don't even have to restart VS Code. Like I'm just going back to my other uh, settings here and it should, it's probably gonna lock up here while it moves everything around. Yeah, but see, it, it just reapplies all my settings and goes back to, this is, how I like my VS Code. That other one was basically a default plus where I just added some stuff. Um, so what we can do here is I have, you know, a lot of times when this does it too, like it's not perfect, sometimes it helps to just do the reload. 
I, I do this one, this, I do this reload window so much, I bound a custom key to it. Because like I, all the time, I'm just like, nope, restart, restart. If you don't know this command, by the way, this is, a, this is like one of the best commands in VS Code. It's basically a way to like reboot VS Code without having to close it and reopen it. So if you just develop a reload window, um, like I bind it to a key, so I just have to hit Control-Alt-R. There's also another one that's pretty helpful. Not as, not as necessary anymore because it's become much more um, stable, but uh, it's probably not good. So PowerShell restart session. This will restart your PowerShell, and same deal. Like, so like I do F5 to like run my scripts. So when I get angry, I smash two more fingers onto control shift and then hit F5 to make it restart it and do it correctly this time. Um, that's how I always remember the shortcut. And so this is just really helpful. This will just restart your whole PowerShell session. So like if something is screwy or your IntelliSense isn't working, that one's a really good go-to. And you know, even just like six months ago, like, you know, I would do that all the time. I almost never do that now. Like if the extension's gotten so much more stable with those debugging pipeline improvements that they were talking about, very difficult stuff that I don't understand. It, it takes real gurus like Patrick, seemingly science on Twitter. You know, those guys, those guys every time. My favorite thing is, um, as a little side note, like if you ever talk to me in the Discord, I, I call myself, I'm the Cunningham's Law guy. Who here knows what Cunningham's Law is? Okay, good. So if you don't know what Cunningham's Law is, it is the best way to get an answer on the internet is not to ask the question, it is to post the wrong answer and someone will correct you. <laughs> so if you come to the PowerShell Discord, you will ask a question, I will very confidently answer you, oh yeah, this is how you do it. And then Patrick or Chris will come in and they'll be like, no idiot, this is actually how it works. I'm like, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, so those guys, those guys really know their stuff, and I, I look up to them all the time learning, you know, they, they help me all the time and mentor me through a lot of this, you know, this of, of learning how to contribute to VS Code PowerShell. I mean, like, those guys just helped me and mentored me. All I did was just ask for help on Twitter, you know, so that's, it's, that's one way you can get into this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, but again, the, the point of that long diatribe is that they um, have done a really good job of really improving the reliability. You guys have probably noticed like it doesn't crash as much, doesn't get stuck as much. It's much better at handling like debug situations going in, going out. And there's always more to do, but like I'm really happy with, especially in the last um, eight months to a year, how really good that process has gotten. So I'm gonna shrink this down just a little bit again. Um, nope, not that part. Is that still readable for you guys in the back? Sorry, we got the long room this time as opposed to the wide room, so yeah, okay, yeah. We'll, we'll go just a little bit bigger. Uh, so, the, so to get back to the thing of user profile debuggers, uh, we'll just go down here and I have to find it in my massive configuration file here. Okay, so you can now define this new thing called launch. So if you define a launch header, you can define, basically this should look just like your launch JSON. So you can define at the user level your launch configurations. So no matter what repository I'm in, I have these particular launch things. Like I have one to just launch an interactive session so I can just do stuff and if I happen to hit a breakpoint, it'll stop there. I have one for just running a file. I have one for running with arguments. I have one for pester tests, you know, that kind of thing. Well, you'll see all these over here. If I go to run, I have no tasks JSON in here. I have no anything like that. But if I go over to my run, I always have these options. See at the top where it says user settings in parentheses? So I always have these PowerShell options for debugging, and I don't have to go set up a launch JSON. I don't have to touch somebody's repo and add in that launch JSON. You can just add it to your user settings now. So it's this exact same format as when you do it. If, if you just wanna, if you're not comfortable with like this format, then all you just do is you just go and you create a new launch JSON and let it, you know, there's those buttons for like add configuration and you can pick what you want and it'll like autofill it for you. You just cut and paste that into here. It's the exact same format. It's literally the exact same schema. And so if you do that, so, you know, here's the ones that come from like the VS Code PowerShell. Here's a couple that come from a test thing that we're doing. Here's a couple that come from my little chat GPT module PowerShell assistant. But at the top always are the ones that, my PowerShell ones are always there. So it doesn't matter what repository I'm in, I'm always able to just immediately debug PowerShell without I do that. Yeah? Oh, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Yeah, so the question was like, if you enable the user settings launch JSON, does that stop the pop-up that says, hey, we're not sure if you have any, uh, hey, we noticed you don't have any launch configs, would you like to create one? I honestly don't know. I mean, we could try it. We could just start a new repo and find out. Here, uh, we'll, um, this thing, yeah, we'll do it live. Okay, am I good? 
Hey, all right, I got a mouse again. Thank you very much, sir. And so we will, I mean, we got time, so we will, we are doing pretty good. So we'll just, uh, I always like to just, you know, my way of doing things is like in my folder, I just make a folder called projects, and that's where I put all my stuff. And if you look at like, if you open up my Windows terminal, I don't know if this has my custom terminal on or not. Yeah, I got that in there. So like, you know, I do a little, I like, I'm a less is more kind of a guy. I like, I, I don't like like the prompts that have like 5,000 things on them. I like it to be contextual. Like if I have a Git repo, show me something. Otherwise, all I want to see is that I'm home. Like I want I want a Zen mode of like focusing on what I'm doing. So rather than see my home, it just says a home. But if I go to projects, this is called Oh My Posh, by the way, is you've probably heard of it for like prompt customization. This is my version of it. Is you want to go to projects, it doesn't show like home slash projects. It shows me a little construction icon and that's just, I just know that, okay, I'm in my projects directory. And then like if I go to PowerShell Assistant, now I start getting, I'm in project slash PowerShell Assistant. So like that's how I work, that, that works for me. You know, everybody's different. But so we can, we can do a new repo here. So we'll do a make dir um, does launch configs annoy you. And we'll do a code dot, which will just start a new VS code in that folder. Wow, that does not read as well as I thought it would in all caps. <laughs> uh, Test.ps1. It does. So that should trigger my PowerShell extension to start. And we will reopen it again. So are you talking about like when you hit debug for the first time? So you're, it's like when you hit debug for the first time, it asks you, right? Yeah. Well, I didn't get it this time, so I guess not. I mean, like, so, but like the runs are here, so like I have this interactive, so I can just say, uh, start this, and we'll do run and hit start. And so, so again, with zero, there's no launch tests or launch JSON in here. Like, it's just coming from my user settings. So really good, you know, if you're just messing around with things, making new folders, doing all that kind of stuff, like, you know, you can now not have to avoid that boilerplate step, makes you just that much more efficient, get stuff done faster. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, I got one more thing. Actually, I think this will be good. So at this point, like, does anybody have any other sort of like general questions like of what I've like covered and covered so far? Should we move on? Yeah. The timeline view thing, right? Okay, let's go back to that. Timeline view doesn't require Git. Doesn't require Git. Uh, so the question was, th with the timeline view, uh, it doesn't require Git, so where is it storing these revisions? It's storing it in your user local state profile. So if you open up your local app data, if you go into VS Code, there's a folder in there that'll have all your previous revisions. So it's stored locally. So yeah, if you take the computer and throw it out the window, yeah, you lost that code. It's not being backed up in any way. Unless, it, but like if you put that folder and you like sim link it to OneDrive, then all those revisions will be backed up on OneDrive and you can get them that way too. But uh, ideally you're using Git, you know, you're back, you're using that to push to remote. But you, and, and if you enable the cloud changes, then it'll back up those, up, up those timelines to cloud changes as well. So, um, but yeah, but it, it's, just, it's basically just automating the process. <laughs> I mean, again, the old school way of my script, my script copy two, my script copy three, it, it's just automating that route of what we used to do that way. It just makes it so that we, it, hitting save, it's basically just saying taking that one and making it copy two and putting it over there. So, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. yeah. I bu yeah, so the, quest the question is, um, you know, so you do this, let's say you have like a 50 gig file and then you go to change it. Does that mean you get like a 50 gig file every time? I, do, I, I don't actually know the full internals of it. I do believe it actually does diffing of it. So that like it's only, at, that's why like partially like, like why the diff system works here, but and you can see the files. And, and also like one thing I didn't mention is like you can right click here and like, you know, again, if this is your good copy, you can just right click and say restore contents and it'll bring that version back. Um, but as far as like the storage, I think there are some like safeguards in there. Cause like this was a feature that was in development for a really long time. And like you can go out and look at the GitHub discussion on it and it's like massive. So um, I don't know for sure. I believe that there, there is like a VS code setting that's like max timeline history. And I think it defaults, it defaults to something like I think like, like probably something ridiculous like 10 gigs or something. But like once you hit that max, then it just starts deleting old history after that. Otherwise it saves it. I, I believe, I'm, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. But that's something that, if you go to the release notes for when it came out, which I believe is in January, there's like they wrote a whole article about how it works. So, 
There's, there's detail for that. Yeah? Um, so it, uh, the question was like, if you are working on something and you're doing timeline, is there any way to highlight which files you want to go back to? So are you talking about like if you made changes to like five files and you want to go back to like a particular time frame or? Just one file. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay. So great example. So let's take this brand new file that I just made. I made an edit four minutes ago. So I make a save, and now I have that change. So you just click rename. So you're gonna say, well, that one it works on my machine. So, so you know, you, the, your guy brings this script, and he's like, you know, he says like, hey, I took your script, it doesn't work anymore. Well, I'll go back to it works on my machine, and I can just do restore. It's like, are you sure? Because once you do this, there's no going back. Because like again, it'll still be in the timeline there. But see, now I'm restored. But then I restore that, and I'm like, okay, now that I figured out. Uh, you know, it just treats as a new revision. So even that previous version where I broke it is still in the timeline. So like when, once you restore, now you're back to that new file. You know, it's basically, you know, conceptually it's like as if you're doing a git commit on every save in a way. So like, and so all the sort of similar kind of rules apply. You can rename a commit, you can go back. That's not what's actually happening. Like it's not using git on the back end, it's using its own custom thing. But you can kind of conceptually think about it that way if that helps. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Any other questions before I move on? Um, yeah. yeah. So regarding like a new function that you need to be notified to the uh, is there anything that you can tell us how much you do that for? Uh, so, in, so the question was like if you're leveraging like Azure functions, is there anything you can leverage from like VS Code for that? Um, for Azure Functions specifically, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I, I know that there's like Azure Functions extensions and stuff like that. Um, I don't know. Is there anybody here who's worked on that at all? I don't think they're here yet. So, all right. Well, maybe maybe we'll come back to that a bit later. So, um, yeah. Like I've worked with it a little bit, but yeah. Like um, let, let me think about that for a bit. We'll do some other stuff and we'll come back to it. Um, all right. So moving on, um, we have some. Items around, let's go to two completions now. So let's, uh, da, da. so one of the things that they were talking about in the presentation yesterday, if you were there, was that there's been all these really great fixes in IntelliSense and completers and all kinds of stuff around VS Code. Um, these kind of come from two different sources. There's fixes that have been done in the, Power, in the PowerShell extension, but a lot of these are actually changes that have been done to the PowerShell repo. So there's this guy, and let me see if I can uh, pull up the PowerShell repo here real quick. Not, that is not the PowerShell repo. Wrong, wrong PowerShell repo. And there's, let's see, if we go to the commits. Uh, so of these, let's see. I've, well, I'll figure out, but you know, I, I had a view that I had saved here, but basically there's this guy, MartinGC94 on GitHub. Nobody knows who he is. Like, he doesn't have a Twitter, he doesn't have, like, he doesn't respond on GitHub, but this guy has made all these contributions to the completion engine. He has fixed so many bugs, added so much cool stuff, and we all just want to, like, highlight him, like, you know, I'll, I'll give him a shout out on Twitter, but like, nobody knows who he is, and he never responds, but he makes great PRs all the time, and they get accepted because they're, they're, they, they change UI stuff so they don't like break scripts. So you know, you know, PowerShell repository is notoriously works very hard to be backwards compatible. So any little change to the language can have huge impacts on you know scenarios. Who knows how people are using it? But you know, for stuff that just like changes the UI and how you edit scripts, you know, that's kind of a low barrier. So so a lot of these PRs are getting accepted all the time. And so he's fixed all this great stuff, and as a result, it carries through to the PowerShell extension. So whereas a lot of this stuff just works at the CLI. These things can also be utilized in the PowerShell extension, because a lot of how the PowerShell extension does its completers and all that kind of IntelliSense stuff is literally just like calling a PowerShell API, basically asking the PowerShell CLI, hey, how would you complete this? And then bringing it into VS Code and doing it in the nice graphical way. So I'm going to go through a few of those, because 
if you've been using the PowerShell extension and you haven't like seen these commits, you might not know that this stuff works now because you might have just done it and then realized, oh, that just does, that, that just doesn't work anymore. And so like, or it's just broken and it's just always going to be broken. Like I do that all the time. Like I'll come back to something and just assume things are broken and then find out, oh no, this all stuff works just fine. So, so what's, we're just going to go down sort of a list of a bunch of these different sort of completers that are now active. So one is um, that I like to start with, because it's got to be at the top anyways, is um, using namespace completion. Um, if you haven't ever used this, this basically makes it so like, who here has ever written a script where you put in, you have to use like a .NET type, but you put it in as like system.management.automation.nextlevel.nextlevel3.nextlevel4.myitem. You know, in your script, all of a sudden you have one line that is just this giant .NET type. So if you don't know, you can use this using namespace keyword at the top of your script, if it's PowerShell 5 or later, I, at this point, I think I should, that should just be the de facto. I assume that you're not writing in 4 or 3 or 2 anymore. You know? And if you are, you already know that this is a problem for you. So I'll probably just say, you know, I'll, just the de facto. So you can now, on every supported version of PowerShell, that's, what, that's the way I'll put it. There we go. Um, you, uh, you can actually use this using namespace keyword. And if you put that at the top of your script, this is sort of like sort of a C sharp kind of, kind of thought, but it kind of got carried over to PowerShell. It's like if you put using namespace at the top, then you can put like that whole prefix part at the using namespace, and then in your code, you can just do the last part. So you don't have to write that whole thing out. So your code becomes much more readable, you know, in terms of like if you're, yeah? So you don't need aliases and computers, uh, I believe that, uh, I don't think there's like a super easy way to do it. Like there, there's, not, there's not something like in TypeScript, you can do something like import this as that. Um, I don't think there's anything specific like that. Typically, what I do in those scenarios is I go one level up. So, like the one thing that I'm doing that's my main thing, that's like you know, you know, component one, component two. Then the thing that conflicts, then in my script I just go one level down so that it's you know, my module dot component one, my module dot component two. So you can tell the difference. But I don't think there's a way to do like specific aliasing. Um, it's too bad Patrick's not here because Cunningham Law would definitely be applying right now, and he'd be like, he'd just raise his hand and he'd be like, this is how you do it. So. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's some way to make it work. I just know it's not like, it's not like a, probably like an easy built-in language thing. Um, anyhow, so, so the point of this being is that you can have that, but sometimes you gotta know like what is the namespace that I can use. So if, if I, you have a terminal, you know, if you're going to do a type here, oh, I probably don't have my, do I have my extension going? Okay. You know, so if you're doing something like system management, so one thing that you all probably know is that any .NET type that's in your thing, this all al already gets auto-completed. So like if you're doing this, you're like, okay, good, I can kind of find my way down to what I'm trying to do, like action preference, for instance. And it, but what's nice is up here, this now auto-completes. So if you're here, all of this stuff now auto-completes. This didn't used to work. So you can kind of get down to what you want. A really common one is like, you know, People like to use like, you know, like generic list as opposed to using like arrays because they can be faster in a lot of situations by a lot. So if you do that, then instead of having to do what you see in code all the time, which is system generic list string, dollar x equals at like that, now you can just do, or sorry, system.collections, that generic list. Now you can just do list. And that will work fine. So if I copy that, Paste it in, take this guy. So you like, it doesn't give me an error saying, I don't know what this type is. Because you can basically put that namespace in there, make your, and you know, this is a lot easier to read, especially if it's like in the middle of a code block. That, oh, it's a, it's a list of strings, as opposed to, it's a system.collection.generic, you know, whatever, list of strings. Um, but that completion didn't work. So that's just, you know, it's a little thing, but it's nice, because it used to be like, oh, you'd have to look it up, and maybe you misspelled it or any of that kind of stuff. You just have to type the first couple letters, hit enter, and then not worry about misspelling it. So this works for requires as well. So with the requires parameter, which allows you to specify in a script, um, you know, you get to say like, hey, if you don't have this module, this script just won't even start, or if you don't have this version of PowerShell. So all of the require stuff now has auto-completion. So if you do the dash, you can now auto-complete these, and if you go to modules and you do it, it will auto-complete the modules that are currently installed on your system. So you can just select the one that you want to require, as opposed to having to guess it. And again, maybe make a typo, maybe not paying attention, can't figure out why your script is starting, and then you realize you put an L where an I should have been, and you know you take forever on that. It just it's just little things like that that like it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but once you get used to it and you're just tab number one like you're you're using less keystrokes because you're just hitting tab to complete it and not writing the whole thing out. 
but you're also ensuring that you're getting the correct thing that you wanted and just avoiding a dumb error. You know, you just, it just saves you just that, it's just that much more time that you don't spend five minutes going, oh, I put an I instead of an L there. And it just makes you that much more efficient, optimizes your VS Code for PowerShell. Hey, look, I said the title. It's, it's I love it when they do that in movies, when they say the title of the movie in the movie. I'm always just, it's like, it's like that, uh, what's that, that, um, that uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, like the Leo, the Leo meme, you know, just like, da, 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 they did it, they did it. Um, so another thing that was shown in the thing, I'm going to go ahead and bring that outline view back up here again, except it's in my sidebar because I moved it. See now, all my stuff screwed up, thanks to you guys. I'm going to bring it back where I like it. I like it over here because that's how I am. Um, so one thing, this is something very, very new, is classes didn't used to be a, sort of like a first class citizen in terms of like VS Code didn't discover them as symbols, but now it does. So now in your outline, you can see that a class is there. And if you have a class defined, you know, it's obvious here because it's like right there, but like if this was like a 500 line file and you're like, where does this dog type come from? You can, you know, you can do the go to definition and take you right there, or you can do the peak definition, which will without leaving where you're at, say, hey, this thing is defined here. And then if you want to go there, you can just double click it and then it'll take you there. So this always worked for functions, this worked for other things like that, but now it works for classes. And so you have all of that. And as a result, because of that, you also have the ability here, um, when you're there, come on terminal, what are you doing? Oh, because I haven't done the class. This is my problem, I never use F8, so. Oh, I don't have F8 belt on this key keyboard. Let's go back to it. Oh, I know why. Again, because I'm a super special snowflake and I don't have F8 bound there because I want to be super special. And I make my F8 control enter or shift enter, but that, now it overlaps. There we go, it's alt enter, that's right, I changed it. So like for my, my, for my F8, I rebound it to alt enter because that way I can like enter, 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 and then alt enter to run the code except now I just completely forgot about that because I've been doing demos in basic VS Code and I hit F8 all the time. Like, why does my F8 work anymore? It's because you unbound it, doofus. Um, okay, so anyhow, to get back to where we were, so now I just have that class here, but so now you have the class, but now I have autocomplete for my classes. So if I have Spock and I do dot, I get all the properties of my class I defined. So again, I don't have to guess what my property is. I don't have to make a typo. I, I can just go there and get it, you know, status. The goodest of boys, for sure. Goodest. Wow, I cannot type today. So there you go. So you, now you have like autocomplete and type inference for, for class parameters. So if you define a class, when you go through the rest of your code, you can make sure, that's one of the really nice things about classes. Like when, if you start getting into like strongly typed languages, like, like uh, TypeScript and C Sharp and that kind of thing, one of the things you end up really kind of missing in PowerShell is like, hey, once a type is defined or I'm using something, I don't have to remember the parameters that are on it. I just hit control space and it just comes up. And I don't have to, I don't have to guess, I don't have to remember, I don't have to look it up, I don't have to go back to the code. I just hit control space and I get that thing. Um, so another thing that's fixed, um, used to be able for enum. So PS style is an example of, a, of an enum. And so it used to be if you did a dot here, nothing would happen. But now if you do a dot, it'll go ahead and populate the enums and you can pick from them. Um, this works for any enum, I just use PS style as an example. But if you have any, anywhere you have like enums in your code, you don't have to, again, go back and look for the reference, hand type, you just hit control space and you get the IntelliSense for it. This is, the, this is one of the coolest ones, if you haven't seen this. So, normally I don't have to ask this question anymore, but who, everyone here done splatting before, or at least heard the term? Okay, pretty good, okay, not, not a ton, okay, that's great. So if you don't know what splatting is, how many of you have ever written a command that is, is invoke thing, you know, invoke rest method, dash header, dash this, dash that, dash that, and you either just make that a totally ugly line, you put in those extremely hard to read back ticks to put it, make it multiple lines, but you, you just have this gigantic command, you know. And the other thing too is like, what if you, how many of you have ever had a piece of code that was like, if this, do this long ridiculous command, else do this long ridiculous command plus this. And then whenever you gotta revise it, you gotta go back through there and figure out, oh wait, which ones are the same, which ones are not, like it's a pain in the ass, it's a pain in the butt. So, excuse me. I, I can never remember like what my levels allowed here. So, uh, so what splatting basically does is it makes it so that you can define a hash table with your parameters in it. So, an example of get item, you can just do. You would typically do like get item dash path this 
And you might do dash include, dash exclude. So instead, you just make a hash table that says include equals what you wanted the parameter to be. Exclude equals what you wanted that parameter to be. Path equals what you wanted that parameter to be. And you can do any kind of stuff you want there. And then if you, when you, you set that as a variable, and then if you do this at symbol instead of a dollar symbol, it'll take that hash table and basically explode those out as parameters on your command. So instead of having this super long command or this really ugly backticky thing, you have this really nice vertical hash table that's really easy to read, very clear what you're trying to do, and then at the end it's just saying run this command with these parameters. And so that has two major advantages, one of which is that you get that nice view, it's really easy to like comment out a parameter and not have it rather than have to de delete it out or delete it and put a pound comment to the sign like don't forget to put this back in dummy because it'll break the script. Um, the other nice thing it lets you do is it lets you do stuff conditional. So when I say like that if stuff, you can have a base set of parameters. And again, it's just a hash table. You don't have to use it immediately after. So right after, you can say like, hey, if this thing, add this additional parameter into that hash table. And you just, it's just a hash table. So you just do, you know, you know like say, you know, if, um, uh, if it's on this particular file system, I want to use force. So if you do that test, then you just do get item params dot force equals true but all the other parameters are still in the hash table, so it just changes that logic that way, and then you get down here. But if that if condition doesn't happen, then your hash table is still just your, your typical parameters and things just go there. So that, that might be, if, for those of you who haven't used splatting, I know that's a lot, um, I'm, so I'm just running through it, but look, look up splatting, it's cool, and what I'm gonna show you next is really, yeah, question? I've never done this before, but how do you, uh, how do you splat if there's a switch parameter, but there's no value? Uh, you just, switch parameters are true/false, so you just do the switch equals true. And if and uh, you, if you did a switch parameter, switch equals false. I hate you. If I see a, <laughs> just just leave the switch off. You don't have to specify it. Again, I'm the I'm not the guy with the prompt with the five thousand things in it. Like I know, yeah, I'm okay with like yeah. You don't alias your things. You don't do that. But I don't need to see every single one of your switches colon false. Like don't do that. Don't do verbose colon false confirm colon false. Like just I get it. That's the default. You don't. For me, for me, I'm always about like, you know, your code should express to me what's, you know, what you're doing, and if you're doing something special, just show me what you're doing that's different. You know, you don't have to be explicit about every, so like you'll see, my, if you look at my code, like I will omit pretty much everything that I can possibly omit because it distracts from what I'm trying to communicate. What I'm, code is for humans, it's not for computers. You know, if we were trying to do everything for computers, we write everything in assembly. Otherwise, everything is just abstracted assembly that makes it easier for humans to interact with computers. That's my philosophy. So when I write stuff, I'm trying to write a story. I'm trying to write, and that's why I love PowerShell, is I can write in this language where you just look at it, and even if you're a business person, you can look at this and get a general idea of what it's doing. And if you can't, there better be a comment from me saying, hey, this is really weird code, but I'm doing it on purpose because it solves a performance problem or it works around this other problem. Otherwise, it's gonna be very clear, very expressive. And even if I can't do that, I'm gonna take that stuff, shun it off into a function that's very clearly defined, you know, it says get this thing. Whereas all the implementation logic is ugly and disgusting, but the actual core flow of the code, anybody should be able to read it, in my opinion. All right, so soapbox over. Four, you know, 40 minutes later, we get back to this. And so, so one thing, though, is like, you know, you get this, but like, how do you know what parameters are on get item? Well, you can come down here and kind of autocomplete, and you'll see that, everybody sees this, they know that. But what you can do now is as long as you define the, ha the, you define the parameter and then you define the splat, when you come into the hash table and you hit control space, you get all the parameters that are from the command. So it evaluates, yeah, that's cool. I do splatting all the time and I would typo commands all the time. I'd have to go look up what the thing is. Now I just go here, like if I get item and I do control space. If I change this to get process, and I do control space. I get the parameters for get process. Yeah. So if you've already picked the parameter that's now defining your parameter set, does it change it? The options It didn't used to, but again, thanks to Martin GC94, God bless him wherever he is. <laughs> uh, yeah, see, name came out of, came out. That doesn't mean you can't still do name, it's just, this is, originally this would. If you have different parameter sets, when you're now locked into one, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. What's what's a good one? Let's see. Let's, let's help. Let's do a help on get item. And Sorry, we're going full nerd now. Yeah. So I think path and literal path are separate ones. So if I do literal path, path should go away. So we'll do get item dash literal path. Nope. 
Uh, come on, magic. Oh, it's because I locked up my, okay. Also, number, number one thing you'll learn in VS Code, and this is just, it just has to be this way, there's another way. If your VS Code terminal is stuck, if, it does, if you can't see the prompt, your IntelliSense is, is not gonna work. Just, just be that aware. So like, if you can't see your prompt and your IntelliSense doesn't work, make sure you can see your prompt. That's like one of the number one things. I'll, I'll get to your question here in just one second. So we're just gonna see if this works and then we'll go from there. So, da -da. so if we come back down here, control space. Okay, so no it doesn't, so but, um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason that couldn't parse it, but there might be re reasons you want to do it. Okay, sorry, what was your question? Uh, have you found any good ways to quickly refactor inline parameters to splatting? I've always wanted that, and I didn't know if anybody had any. Yeah, there's a guy named, there's a guy on the Discord called Seemingly Science, Patrick, who knows everything under the sun. So there, there's this thing called the PowerShell Editor Command Suite. And it works on the command line as well as PowerShell, but what he does is that he's written a bunch of refactorings just like that, where you can highlight a thing. I don't have it installed here because um, I, I was doing some stuff. Um, in short, basically, look up, actually, here, let's pull it up here. Editor, command, suite, Patrick is rad, is what I would normally type, but there we go. Okay, so this thing. If this editor services command suite, he adds all kinds of stuff that, um, adds all these refactorings. And so you can go in, you know, this will probably demo a bunch of them. But so you'll do that, you'll add a code action and it does all this crazy stuff you can do. And that one you just did, convert command to splat expression, did you see that? It went by really fast, but th that does that. I use, I use that a bunch. So yeah, yes, there is a way to do that. It's not built into the PowerShell extension, but the PowerShell extension has extensibility to do that kind of stuff, and he's written a module that uses that extensibility. We're hoping to make that a lot nicer. Right now it's just command palette stuff. We want to eventually, t well, I want to, I'm not part of the PowerShell team, but I mean like, I want to hopefully, if I ever get time on my giant pile of to-do list, one of the things I want to do is be able to take all the things that show up in that command palette to do it and convert them to code action. So that when you, when you get us, when you're on a command that's, say like, you know, you can set a preference that says, if a command has more than four parameters on it, give me a little light bulb and let me click that and say convert to splat expression. Like, that's what I want to do. It's not there yet, but it is certainly possible, so. I want that <laughs> well, again, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the PowerShell extension is open source, and you can feel free to open a PR anytime. All you gotta do is, all you gotta do is become an expert in TypeScript, become an expert in C Sharp, understand all the internal working engines of PowerShell, and you can contribute. Like, it's so easy, anyone could do it. <laughs> That's why it only took me like five years to make my first PR. Yeah. Um, so the, the splat is converted to parameter auto optimization. Yes. Is that just parsing the base? No, I mean, it'll parse the whole script. So like if, I, I mean, I don't know if it works cross script. Like if you had it defined as a script variable here and your dot sourcing other, I haven't like stress tested to that level. But you can certainly like, you can take this guy and put him way down here and it'll still work. And it, um, yeah, because like as long as it's in scope, because what it does is that whenever you make a call to the completion, it goes to PowerShell and there's this special like git completer API. And it's a really simple API. It's just simply, it's almost like chat GPT. It's, it's, like, it's basically just asking PowerShell, hey, here's the code, what could possibly complete this? And then there's a whole series of crap that kicks off of AST parsing and, and flow rules and visitor patterns and stuff I don't understand at all that eventually comes with the result of here's, here's what you can complete it with. And all this, ext the extension part is actually really light. Like none of the logic of this is in the VS Code part. That's all in, it's not even in the editor services part for the most part. It's in the PowerShell repo. Like all that stuff happens inside PowerShell. That's why this stuff works at the command line too. Like if you're doing a, um, uh, this might be hard to demo, but we'll try it. Test equals that, get item at test. See, it works at the command line. Okay. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's, it's passing this through in a nice GUI thing, but all this stuff works in PowerShell too. That's, that's one of the things I want to note. Is pretty much every one of these completers, if, if, you, if you're super hardcore and you, you don't even use Notepad, you, you write your scripts as multi-line command one-liners, like it can help you here too. Con, this, the control space, well I have it bound to control space, I don't know if that's the default still, I think it is. But um, yeah, all those same completers work at the command line. I'm just demoing them in VS Code because they come up automatically for you and you don't have to remember. And sorry, yeah, let me, let, me, let me blow that up a little bit, sorry, for those in the back. 
So if you didn't see what I did, I just basically did the same line of code that I did in VS Code, but I did it at the command line, and then I hit Control Space, which is sort of like the autocomplete, just like when you would like Control Space a parameter, just showing that all this stuff is not VS Code magic. This stuff works in just your standard PowerShell command line. The caveat being, most of this stuff, you need PowerShell 7.3, and some of it you need the 7.4 preview. Um, so like, this is not gonna work in 5.1, this is not even gonna work in 7.2 LTS for the most part. Most of these completions are new. But, you know, again, we're all PowerShell guys, it's not that big of a deal to install the current version. And um, if you're running on the current version, these are some of the advantages that you get from doing that. Even if you're authoring 5.1 scripts, if you author them in 7, it makes it much easier to author. And then you can just, you, just as long as you make sure it's still 5.1 compatible and test it in 5.1, you know, you still get all the power and the ease of use, and you can still write 5.1 scripts. Or Windows PowerShell scripts. I don't even know what I'm supposed to call it anymore. Like, I still say PowerShell core occasionally. I don't mean to. Okay, so moving on to the next item. Um, so one thing that I've been doing a lot of, like when I worked in TypeScript a lot, like a thing I love is like all these things of like implied types. Like basically, in PowerShell everything's dynamically typed. And that's super useful, especially if you're a beginner. Because you don't want to have to figure out that an int needs to be a string, or you don't want to get these cryptic errors that, hey, this type doesn't match that type. Like it feels all super anal retentive, and like I just want to get stuff done. And 85% of the time, that's how I am. The other 15% of the time, I'm working on a really large code base, and my PowerShell scripts, I change one thing, and now I spend the next three hours finding all the places that, of the references that I messed up and didn't figure out, and getting cryptic errors, getting null references, getting all that kind of stuff, drives me bananas. It's like the most biggest waste of my time, to the point that like whenever I'm working with PowerShell, I'm like, why can't I have that stuff? I mean, I know why I can't, but like, you know, like when I'm, like, I really like that, like, if I define this thing, if I just take a little more extra time and, like, really rigidly define something, that the compiler, before I even run the script, is going to say, hey, dummy, you referenced a property five scripts over and 20 functions away that you don't have on this original one. Did you mean to do that, or are you just forgetting that this thing was referenced there? And so, and then, most of the time, like, Again, I'm all about like really tight developer loops. Like if I'm doing stuff, I want feedback as fast as I can. That's why like an extension you may have seen when, I, when I'm doing things here, if I do something that's not real, uh, my prompt up, oh, my extension was running. You know, all these little context things and like, you know, you know, most people, by default, you get your errors down the property bar. There's this extension called error lens, which I talk about in um, the previous ones. I know that's really hard to see, but all my errors are right next to where the error is. You know, I'm just like, I think it shows up on the namespace one when I had it like kind of half completed. But, you know, I like to have my context like right there. It's like if there's an error, tell me right away. I don't want to look at a thing. I don't want to run a linter. I don't want to do any of that stuff. Like, like figure it out as fast as you can to help me fix my problems. So that's all yet another long rambling preamble to um, if you type your variables in PowerShell, if you define a type, then what that does is it locks that variable to that type. So if you're writing a long script and you, you say, you know, you know, you know, you know, like my credential, you know, and you set that to, if you lock that type, then if later in the script you forgot you, were, you had already named it that credential and you try to assign it to, you know, something completely different, it'll give you an error saying, hey, you tried to, you tried to put a string in a PS credential and that doesn't work. Whereas if you don't put that, PS credential in front, it'll happily let you reassign it just fine and completely break your script in a really weird to debug thing that takes you forever to figure out where the problem was. But one other thing that's really nice about typing your variables, if you type your variables, you get all the IntelliSense for them. So if you type that just like that, now if I'm referencing this thing later, I get all the, if I do IntelliSense, I get all the properties right there. I don't have to guess, I don't have to go back and look at the variable to see what type it was, I don't have to go out to the PowerShell help to see what things are. I don't have to run git member to then find out my things. It's just right there. You know, that whole loop of going to git member and finding the properties, it's just right there. This works for any .NET type. It does, it's not just PowerShell stuff. Sorry, go ahead. Does it work if you only cast the type but don't actually change the HTTP Uh Yeah, most of the time it should. So if you do that. Uh, maybe not. Oh, it's because you haven't assigned it, so actually the type is still technically null. The, and the, the thing is, is that because PowerShell is not statically typed, it's still a runtime thing, so the editor has to see what that variable is assigned to. If it's assigned to null, then it's going to be, what goes to the PowerShell completer thing is, hey, what things can complete null? And the PowerShell extension just kind of stares at you like, what are you even doing here? You know? <laughs> it's like, do you, do you not know how this works? You know? Um, It probably does. I mean, again, 
all these completer APIs, like a lot of this stuff is just passed through into PowerShell. It's just a lot of the stuff was broken or didn't exist. So the only thing about ISC is that it's locked to 5.1. So any of the completers, the, like the splatting stuff is never gonna work in ISC because that's seven stuff. Um, but I imagine a, a lot of like the basic stuff of like, of like, I'm not even gonna say that basic is not the right term for it. Like a lot of the typical stuff you would expect like parameter completion and even some of this type stuff if you define the type or if you have it as a runtime type, yeah, all that, none of that's like super fixed. And in fact, this is something, I'm not, I'm not showing something right now that's fixed. This is actually just a preamble to the other stuff that I'm gonna show. So this is more like, if you've never seen this before, just be aware that like, if you type a variable, then you get really nice IntelliSense through the rest of your script. So now that everybody's on board with that concept, right? So our credit equals our magazine. See, that, see now, I can use my timeline view over here and just be like, hey, what changed here? This is actually Git, but in my gutter, it shows me just nice little indicators of like, hey, you added something here, you changed something here. And I can click here and see exactly, it's kind of hard with the small screen, but I can click here and see, okay, this is exactly what I changed and what changed. I took that thing and I edited it from that to that. Say, okay, revert it. You know, fix my stupid mistake. And now it's fixed. So that, that, now that doesn't use timeline, that uses git, so that was going back to my last git commit when I was testing this. That is super useful, like if you just want to experiment with something and you just hack away on it, but you don't want to like revert your whole repository, you don't want to figure out the git reset command line to get that one file, you just go to that gutter. And it's also really good in like code, or if you like were working on some code and you walk away from it because you had to go fix an emergency, you come back three days later and you're like, what was I even doing here? You know, well you can go to the diff, you can go to the thing, or you can just go in the code and then just look for those little gutters. Again, it's just little UI things that can make a huge difference in your productivity once you get used to using them. Like, this, you know, I will never fault anybody for writing PowerShell Notepad. If that works for you, great. But just like stuff like ChatGPT and stuff, like if you get an assignment, I get an assignment, and I have all these tools and Copilot and little magic brushes in Copilot, which I'll show you that just let me magically fix stuff, like, I'm gonna get this project done faster than you, and then who's gonna get promoted first, you know? So that's it, you know, it's just what it comes down to. And now, if you have no competition and that works for you, that's fine, like, you know, you know there's plenty of room for COBOL programmers still, you know, but. <laughs> but, like, that's my philosophy. My philosophy is, like, you know, as soon as I saw ChatGPT, I'm just like, I gotta learn everything about this, because, like, it was like, as soon as VMware came out, it was the first time I saw VMware, I like, I have to learn this because I don't have a job in 10 years if I don't learn this. As soon as I saw cloud stuff really take off, like AWS and Azure, I'm like, I need to drop VMware right now because I need to get into this stuff. Because it may not be 10 years, it may not be 20 years, but like, if I want to be where the action is and I want to be where all the exciting stuff is, I got to get ahead of this. Now, I didn't do that with crypto, I didn't do that with NFTs, thankfully, but <laughs> you got to pick and choose sometimes, but yeah. So, um, so that's the whole concept of the idea of being able to do those kind of completions. But now there's a lot of additional kinds of inferences that you can do. So one thing that you can do is that if you set output type on a function, you can specify the type. And this, is just, this doesn't have to be like just PowerShell types. Like I made that class earlier, that dog class. And so now that I have this function, that's defined in my thing, and I'm just gonna go ahead and run it just to make sure it's in here. So now that that output type is defined, if I'm, wherever I'm calling that function, now I get auto-completion for the result of that function. And the reason you have to do output type, because in PowerShell by default, you can output anything. Like, it's not strict on what you return. And that output type is not strict. It's not gonna error if you output a string. Like, it's, it's, it, you're just basically offering a hint, saying, hey, I wrote this function, and you just have to trust me that what's gonna come out of it is something of the dog class. So, but now it makes it so that, again, you can have that function be in a module that's somewhere completely different and you're using script. You don't even have to know how that thing was written. But then when you do get dog, before you even test it and run it, when you get to your next step, you can get the IntelliSense and already know what the properties are. Again, without having to do git member, without having to do all that, you're saving maybe, you know, maybe you're saving 30 seconds. But if you save 30 seconds a thousand times, that starts adding up to real chump, chump change, you know? So then once you have that, another nice thing is, um, you have the same kind of, I, I demoed this earlier, I, I jumped that, so yeah. So you can auto-complete these, but one thing that's kind of neat is that, you know, you can, you don't have to do the, you don't have to know the very specific namespace. You just have to kind of know what your type is. So if I want to do something like PS credential, PS credential is a bad example, because it's got an auto-completer, uh, you do like process. So 
Like, you know, these are all the .NET types in my system. Like, everything in .NET that's loaded in my system, whether it comes from modules, whether it comes from what's built into PowerShell, whether it comes from what PowerShell adds in, every .NET type auto-completes here. And you notice that was pretty fast. It used to be a lot slower. They, they, Patrick did a lot of great work speeding that up. But what happens is when you go here, like, I don't have to know, actually, let's go back to my list example. Like, I don't have to know, this might not work because I have the, uh, yeah, because I have it as a namespace. Let's see, what's a better example? Let's do, what are these specialized ones? Let's do concurrent bag. There we go. So I just know, you know, I read somewhere that concurrent bag is something I should use. But I don't know what library provides, I don't know, but I know it's built in. So when I do this, I select this concurrent bag. Once I select it, it auto-fills the rest of the name for me. So you don't have to remember system collections concurrent. You just know concurrent bag. And, you know, and then like, I don't have to remember the rest of that stuff, just fill it in for me. And you saw when I did list, because I did the using namespace, like if you do list here, because I had the using namespace at the top, it doesn't complete the rest of that, because it knows that I, already, I told it already, like, I don't want all that junk. Just anything in this space, I just want the short name. So again, another nice little thing, speeds things up, optimizes your, your experience. Um, one thing I, I do hope that we eventually get added is very similar to like how TypeScript and C Sharp work, where like you can do a type like concurrent bag and have an option where if you hit enter here, rather than put the whole thing out, it will just put the short one and then put the using namespace at the top for you. But that's how it works in TypeScript. That's how it works in C Sharp. It's super nice. It's super convenient. And I do believe there's a way we can make that work for PowerShell too. And have it as an option, obviously. Not everybody wants that, but it would be a really nice option. Um, so um, one other thing that's been fixed is positional parameters. Um, so what you can do is that um, it used to be there used to be an issue like if you had different positional parameters, like when you did these completions, these completions usually come up in like if you have, if you've written a script that has like, you know, I want this to be the first implied parameter, I want this to be the second implied parameter. Um, this has been fixed so that if you specify those, you can get to where you need to go. and, and um, and, and have it actually show the right, correct next parameter, where sometimes it would fail out at this point. Just a little thing. Um, so getting back to the whole thing about types. So one thing that commonly happens is that um, when you do things like get process select object, now at that point, like the PS item, again, you're looking at that PS item, you're like, what came out of this command? What, do I need to get member on this to find out what's in there and that kind of stuff? So now there's inference for that. So if you get process and you do it to for each object, select object, where object, any of those sort of built-in like iterative link style um, uh, uh, commandlets, now on the PS item, you see it has all the properties of my process. So I don't, I don't again, I don't have to go look it up. I don't have to do anything. Just as I'm writing, whatever whatever type that is. In this case, you know, it's a uh, it's a process type. So again, I can change this from get process to get child item. And then when I do my dot, I get child item properties. So that works with select object, where object, et cetera. Really nice, again, saves you a little bit of time. If you're not intimately familiar with it, if you're working with an API, you're working with a custom module, you know, you don't have to go look it up. It's just, it's just right there. You might have to look up like what that property does, but you know, at least you're getting pretty much all the information you would get from Git member just like right there. Um, this is just a simple one. This IntelliSense now works. Like if you have an attribute, you can actually, oh, this IntelliSense would not work, and now it does work. So if you ever tried that before and it broke, it works now, let's try it again. Um, this one's kind of neat. So if you have a PS custom object, like you know, you do a select object, also the, all this stuff, all, if you hover over commands, this has all been rewritten, it's gonna get better than this too, like we're hoping to get all like the get help and all that stuff in there. But for now, like you get all the different parameter sets of that command just by hovering over it. That's really nice. Um, but if you, have an, if you have something and you take a variable and you um, do like a select object on it, then that just becomes a PS custom object. But PS custom objects don't have types, you know, like it's a PS custom object. Like it, it has types in the sense that it is, it is now technically like a new .NET type, but it's not as easy to infer as something like get child item. Well, because we know what you selected, now um, this now works. So that, oh, maybe it doesn't, I gotta do the individual item on there. Technically, it's not a PS custom object. It's a selected and dot and then the name of the original. Yeah. Why is this not happy? Well, I'm, I might be lying about this one, but I had it working. 
Okay, we'll, we'll chalk that one up to the demo gods, but typically what would work with this one would be is that if you did the select object through, oh, wait, am I on seven? I think this is a 7.4 one, so I might be in the wrong version of PowerShell. No, I'm on 7.4, okay, I don't know. This is a preview thing, this will be in the next preview, but um, this is another one of those, I, I, like a lot of this I just went down that guy's crazy commits, and I'm just like, oh, this works, oh, this works, oh, this works, well, I'll just put all those in a file and show that to everybody. Um, but this one, basically, the way it should work, if you did the dollar X, you should only see, like, name and path. Like, because it can know that you selected name and path, therefore name and path should be the only things on this thing. Um, get random now passes through, so that same thing, but, like, if you have a get random in between, um, all the, you know, these are all get child item properties. Before, this would break, and, like, it wouldn't be able to know what your PS item was because you passed it to some other command that doesn't have an output type. Now it can infer that get random always outputs whatever same type came into it so that it can know that, okay, you know, you passed a child item in, so by reference, get random can't change that. It's always just gonna output child items back out, so now this IntelliSense works. Um, so if you do PowerShell classes a lot, and again, my advice generally for PowerShell classes, they are awesome for data types. They are awesome for structuring data, making sure, you know, defining contracts, so that when somebody sends you something or they're using your, your thing and they need to send you an object, that you can force them to use a certain type or otherwise it'll error out. If, um, if uh, I, I don't recommend like you go crazy and try to treat them like C-sharp types, like don't try to do tons of methods, any of that kind of stuff, you're just gonna be in for a world of pain. Don't try to have classes inherit from other classes. If you're gonna do that, at least put them all in a single file, don't try to spread them out. Um, there's, a whole, there's a whole PowerShell issue about, I call it the classes here there be dragons issue that lists all the problems with PowerShell classes. And it's, it's just because that they were never really designed, they were designed to make DSC easier. That's all that they were there for. And they just have this nice side effect of being this really nice way to structure data sometimes. So all that being said as my, as my sort of like uh, preamble, um, there's some nice new IntelliSense here too. So if you have like a class Great Pyrenees, yeah, and it inherits from dog. That's what that colon means. It's like I have dog, now I have a new class, Great Pyrenees, that inherits from it. If you make a constructor for that, the constructor will inherit the prop, will know the properties that came from that parent class. So like if you're inheriting any class, like if you're inheriting something out of the base library, if you're inheriting something out of a closed source .NET library that you don't have access to, so you can't see the source code, you now, you don't have to, again, guess, you don't have to get member, you have to do some crazy Byzantine things like do a test constructor just so that then you can get member on that object to find the properties, you just do dot. And now you know what all the base properties are available in addition to whatever you defined on this. Like if I, if I added another property here, that would be, you know, um, I don't know, fluffiness, because he's a pretty fluffy boy. Uh, if I had a property for fluffiness, then fluffiness would be in this list in addition to the properties of the, of the above class. So really nice. Uh, da -da. Um, with hash tables, it didn't used to be able to infer the types of the um, things that are on them. Now it can. So, again, same kind of pass through. Before you would do test items, and then like it wouldn't know like what's in there. Now, it, now it'll pass through so that you can get your IntelliSense on whatever that property of the hash table is. So even if each of your hash tables have different properties, you go to different properties, each one will give you different IntelliSense based on whatever, whatever you assign to that property. You don't even have to pre-type it beforehand as long as it's populated. Um, this one's kind of nice. Um, if you use any kind of .NET method constructors, which, oh, is there a record? Not my, did I not get this in here? Mm, yeah, of course. It's because I, way up here, this is Ansible, supposed to be using namespace. So here we go, so a quick example, it's like, oh, I forgot the other stuff. So first of all, Copilot did this for me, that's cheating. But if I didn't have Copilot, I just start with system, management, control space, dot A, control space, and I just save myself how much typing and how much time, you know, because I use the IntelliSense, it just goes much faster. So now that I have that in there, and technically I have to run it down here for it to show up. Now error record will work, because I, again, I do everything short, otherwise this should be system, or. You can usually leave system off, so, and so this would have to be management automation error record. But here, because I did that using namespace, it can just be error record. So, but now that it's here, I can do a new, and if I auto-complete this, now you get um, all the different constructors that you can use for that .NET type. If you don't do a lot of .NET type stuff, every once in a while you have to run into this stuff. Every once in a while there's something you can't do in PowerShell, 
but there's something in .NET that lets you do it. And so if you ever use this new thing, before, like, this was just a, a wild guess. Or you would type new without the parentheses, hit enter in the command line, look at it there, but it's right here for you. And so you don't have to guess, and you have that available right there. Another thing that has been updated in VS Code, this drove me crazy for years. You couldn't resize this dialog. You now can. <laughs> you can stretch this thing however you want. It used to be fixed, so like if the stuff ran off the screen, you're out of luck. You know, or if it was too tight, tough, tough stuff. Use an ultra wide, you know, it's like we don't accommodate your, your ivory tower status. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you mean you mean like pop it out? Yeah. So not really because um, I don't. Let's see. I I see. Never, I, I never use that. So, but um, I haven't ever done it like that. Um, it, it's not possible to like have it as like. I don't think it's possible to have it in like like the side pane. Like I don't think it's where like you do new and then it shows up over there. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't technically be possible because the component can be moved to the web view. It just hasn't been programmed to do that. So, um, yeah, again, that, I'm sure somebody out, out there watching this recording is screaming at me right now, being like, yeah, you just changed this setting and it works fine. But I don't know how to do it personally. That's just not something I do much. So yeah, I can't answer that one, sorry. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the main run of completers. And that took up a heck of a lot more time than I expected it to, But because you guys ask such great questions. All right, uh, let's see. What else can we get to here in a little bit here? So. Um, I think the last thing I'll do is just some of the neat debugging stuff that exists. Um, so I'm, a lot of the customization of like tuning and tweaking and all this stuff in, um, if you go watch those earlier videos that I talked about, there's all kinds of stuff in there. There actually is not that much new. There's some neat new extensions. There's a lot of that neat kind of stuff, and we can talk about some of those maybe after the session if you want to know about them. Um, but for now, I'm just going to show off some more of the debugging stuff. So here's a sort of a simple debug script as an example. So I have a script. I just put in a couple global, a global here so you can see what that looks like, a script variable so you can see what that looks like. I have a function here, get test, and that function has, sets a couple things and then invokes another function. And that other function is down here. It takes one parameter and then has another parameter that we don't set, it's just implied, and then returns that parameter. So does that, that makes sense? Like, it's just a simple function that calls another function. And so anybody confused about like, what this does it should be pretty straightforward. So we're going to go ahead and, run, and then way down at the bottom, I actually run the thing. So the first thing I'm going to do is one thing that's really nice is anywhere that there's a variable in your code, you can now right click it and just say add to watch, and now it'll monitor that for you through the debug session. Whereas before you had to manually type it, maybe typo it, any of that kind of stuff. Now it, you know, you can do that with test parameter here too. We'll just go down here and add to watch, and now it's tracking it over there in my debug console. This, st this stuff does not scale well to very high font. Typ typically, this stuff is very small. It's very easy to read, so but you know, bear with me here. So then uh, I have a few breakpoints set. Um, we'll go ahead, and actually, I'm going to take the breakpoints out for now. So we're just going to go ahead and run this script for now, just use using my fancy interactive, my user settings, so there's no JSON in here. So run, ran the script, ran just fine, and if I expand my terminal up here, it's probably showing the detail here, clear. Yeah, so it runs it, and so I get that five that I set at the test here, which then got set down here. So one neat thing that we can do now is, um, let's go ahead and break point to this point, right, right up to the point where right before output, because like let's say I'm getting an output of seven, I'm like, why am I getting seven? I don't understand. So I do, I set my breakpoint, I hit my run, and it goes through there, goes through get test, go through invoke inner function, and then gets in here and then ends up here. So there's a couple neat things. Um, you might not see this yellow stuff on your right. This is one of the extensions that I covered in the past. It's called inline variables, written by Tyler, who used to manage the VS Code extension. I don't know why this is not in the main extension. It's just it, his extension works. There's no reason to merge it. But that's a great extension to get. This lets you see what it's supposed to be. But you'll notice this variables pane has changed a lot. Um, one thing is that there's all these different headers now. So this is where I get to get the claim to fame. This is, this is the thing that drove me crazy. And I spent a whole bunch of time learning TypeScript, learning C Sharp to, I wrote this. So um, I made this so that I really like this idea of auto. Like in Visual Studio, if you do C stuff, C Sharp stuff, and I do very little C Sharp stuff, I'm getting a little bit better. 
I really like this idea that like, hey, I want a section, show me variables that are contextually appropriate to what I'm doing right now. I don't want the dump end variable list and have to find what I want. I just want the stuff that's like appropriate to my function. So I came up with just some general logic of scope and that kind of stuff to try to figure out, hey, what's important to you? So if, I, if I'm here at test parameter, then obviously the things I care about are my parameters that were coming in. So there's test parameter and not set parameter. And of course, those watches that I said earlier, they're set to where I had. So I can see where I'm at, where I'm screwing up, all that kind of stuff. But I also have all these other scopes that exist. So I can see all the variables that are part of my command. So how many times have you ever done like, you know, you go in and you're debugging, but then you try to do my invocation and it doesn't come back with anything? It's because you're already past where that my invocation was uh, defined. But now we capture that so you can come in here and you can see your my invocation and your PS bound parameters and see all that stuff without having to do it at the command line or having to set a, you know, do a write host to see what it is. Like you can see what it was at the time. And then you, then you have your local scope. So, you know, you have your auto for like your most important stuff. But like if you want to see the stuff that's in the local scope, then like those script variables that I set, you come down to script scope and you get all the fancy variables, all the automatic variables. And then of course in script down here is my scripty script bar. And because I set it to an object, this stuff used to be really ugly. I rewrote all this so that arrays look really nice now. Like you used to get all that, the, all this stuff, there's a little section down here for raw view. Um, this is what it used to look like. And yeah, like, it's like, is that really useful to you when you're debugging? Like how much of that stuff do you really care about? Yeah, you don't care about that. You care about what's the object and what's its properties. And this works for hash tables, works for any kind of object. We got all that stuff fixed. It was a massive pain for me to figure out because it's already complicated enough as it is. But all that stuff now works. And, but but if, you, if for whatever reason your bug is so esoteric that you gotta get into all this crazy detail, it's still there under that raw view. And then of course your globals, and in my globals is uh, my fun global variable which is there. So you have this nice like breakout. So you can see like, are, is your thing being infected by another variable? Is it being overwritten? You know, were you expecting to grab a script variable, but if you see it in local, you realize, oh, I accidentally defined this variable in local, and I wanted the one from script, so now I gotta go find where to find local and get it out of there. You know, it helps you solve all those really hard to find problems that aren't just gonna come up with an easy parser error of, of, you know, you didn't assign this variable, or, you know, this thing threw an error. It's that stuff where I wanted it to be five, and it's seven, but the script works, so like, okay, how do I troubleshoot that? Like, where do I even start? So you just start by stepping through the code. One other thing that's really nice here is that there's this call stack feature. So in the call stack, it shows, like I said, I, I told you how it ran and you just kind of had to trust me, but here you can see how it actually ran. It, it started at the interactive session where I started the thing. It started this little script block, which is basically the way that we hook into, it just, it's basically just dot sourcing the, the thing running. And then the next thing it did is it went to get test. It went through get test until it got here. And you see how the different colors? The green is basically like, hey, this is where we left get test to get to where we are now. And so now we're in invoke function. And then the yellow is, this is where we are now. And of course, you know, the giant big yellow arrow also helps too. But you can also see the line number over there. Um, and so then we can go to our main function. So we can see how we got here. So this is really useful like, if you're doing a loop or if you're working with some other code. Sometimes you, you get to a point, or like, or this is really good, like if you get an error message, you can search for the error message, in the, especially if, like, if you're taking over a, a somebody else's code, like if you're taking over a coworker's code, and you get some error message, you're like, wh where did this error message come from? You can just search for the error message in the code, put the breakpoint there, and then run the same code, and when you get to where that error message is, you can see how you got there. And then you can work, you can work your way backwards and then realize, oh, I see. This was supposed to be this, but he didn't put any kind of parameter validation on this thing, and he let me type, you know, he let me type cookies when I was supposed to type, you know, dinosaur, and that's why it doesn't work, because he didn't let me not type cookies. But one really nice thing about this is, check this out. If you look at the variables, if I go back to get test, I see the variables at the time it went into invoke my function. So you can see this, not, you don't have to set a breakpoint here and then step in you can automatically go back to where it was when it left that command and see the state where it is. It basically, you're, it's almost as if you're going back in time and leaving your breakpoint here, but without actually having to rerun the script and go there, which is super nice. And again, none of that is like super magic in the code extension. All that stuff actually happens in PowerShell. Like 
the, if you look at the PowerShell debugging code, you know, PowerShell's not three million lines of code for nothing. I mean, <laughs> it's not all fat. Like, there's, there's a lot of very complex, very well written out, much smarter than me, or at least much more anal retentive than I am, to write all the code to capture all that stuff. And all I had to do was figure out a way to tease it out and display it in VS Code, and that's what I did. Um, so that, that's kind of like the main aspects of the debugging in a nutshell, but I really wanted to show those different views. Um, one last thing I want to show is this new thing that was added to VS Code. And again, it's great because VS Code is so written with the extensions and it uses all these standard APIs, is sometimes they add something and then we just get it for free because it just calls the APIs that we had already defined with a contract with the VS Code extension. Sorry, the VS Code extension host, which is where the VS Code extension runs inside. There's this whole long API of like contracts that they give us. They say like, hey, you know, if this thing happens, you know, we're gonna call this function, and then you can do whatever you want with that function. Just let us know, we're just letting you know that, hey, this event happened inside VS Code. So there's this nice new feature. Another way I can do this is like, say I don't want to set any breakpoints, say I don't want to do that, I just want to check something. What if I just want to right click this, and I want to debug, I want to run the script until I get to where my cursor is. So if you click run my cursor, it runs the script, and it came right to where my cursor was. I didn't have to set up a debug, I didn't have to do any of that. What this does is it calls your default debug profile, which in my case this was run file. It, it just sets a breakpoint, basically, in the background. But it's a nice little UI thing where it's just like, okay, I did that. Okay, I see how that happened. But what if I want to be here? Okay, so I don't have to set a breakpoint. I have to go click run. I just right click here, run to, you know, run to cursor. I want to see how I got there. And now I'm there. So that is... So I use this, as soon as they introduced that feature, I, I just saw it one day, I was just right-click, I'm like, what the heck is this? And I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> and, like, and this, that run to cursor works in TypeScript, works in C-sharp, again, because they all just use the same standard breakpoints API. Like, we didn't implement this. They just, they just made a fancy thing that does all the breakpointing type stuff for you. And because we wrote to the breakpoint interface, well, I didn't write, Tyler did most of that. Um, you know, then it just works. And that's one of the really great things about the whole VS Code ecosystem and kind of what I want to close on is the great thing about VS Code is it's just like PowerShell in terms of philosophy. The idea is that you take the time to learn the tool and they will do their best to make sure that it's the best investment you've ever made because it's got a community around it that's passionate about it, but can't tell, right? Um, that, you know, wants to make it better, has all the same frustrations you have, and that they're like, we want to enable those people who get frustrated just like I do. It might be a hurdle, the PowerShell extension more than most because the PowerShell extension has to be extremely complicated just due to the nature of making it work like ISE. Um, the, uh, but you know, they empower us to be able to contribute these things and make it so that everybody benefits. And that's part of the spirit and philosophy of open source, why PowerShell is open source now, why PowerShell is such a wonderful module library that you know, anything you can want to think when somebody thinks it up and they've had the same problem you have, and they've taken the time to publish it. And if you've had the problem and you want to publish it, you have that there. So if you believe in that philosophy and you believe in PowerShell and open source, um, it's my opinion that VS Code matches that same sacred promise and it's worth checking out. So thank you very much. And I wish you a good conference.